Put on. No. Oh, it is. It is. Thank you so much. Lovely. Welcome back. I hope uh, you managed to get a little comfort break and perhaps some lunch. You're very welcome to our next session. It's going to be delivered by Hector Minto from Microsoft. Hector's role at Microsoft as lead technology evangelist sees him engaging with major global employers and Microsoft's commercial partner network and a wider set of community stakeholders to showcase inclusive design, product accessibility, inclusive hiring practices, the role of disability employee resource groups and accessibility innovation. So in other words, this is really crucial, critical stuff. And I think most people in the room will know that technology has transformed the lives of many people with disabilities, particularly on the communication side. Um, Hector is also the incumbent UK Government Disability and Access Ambassador for the technology sector. And we're really delighted to have him here today, Hector. Thanks so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending this session. Uh, firstly, I'd really like to thank Centre Harkin, Joseph Jones and team, uh, and the City of Belfast for putting on what's been an amazing event so far. Um, we're going to talk for the next 45 minutes about how we get deliberate about accessibility knowledge. You know, fundamentally, accessibility knowledge is, is really one of the biggest barriers to inclusion out there in the workplace, in education, in society at large. And we're learning a lot about this space. Uh, we've certainly been learning a lot about that over the last five years. Um, I'm just going to put a few base, you know, a, base, a, ba a baseline of information in front of you just to make sure we're all on the same page. But essentially I've worked for 26 years in the field of assistive technology. Uh, essentially technology built specifically for people with disabilities to remove some of the barriers to mainstream technology. Uh, things like uh, communication devices, home control units, uh, eye gaze control for, tech, for computers. Um, but all of it has been designed around the consumer, the individual. Uh, I'm going to use the word the patient. Many of the pieces of technology that we were putting in place were funded by healthcare systems, uh, specifically to make independent living more accessible. But very little of it has been actually focused on workplace. Uh, some specific exceptions to that rule. Essentially, these have become a niche set of tools designed for a specific group of people and generally requiring an assessment before funding. This essentially is another barrier. We've got to make sure that we really lean into this, uh, this mission of making assistive technology affordable to all. Assistive technology budgets are often argued about. I mean, can we believe we live in a world where budgets for technology that empowers people with disabilities is argued about in terms of how many millions should we spend when we know that it creates massive cost savings out there because people become independent. The people cost uh, is decreased when we put technology in place. This has also led to a lottery of provision. You're lucky if you find somebody who will tell you about assistive technology. You're lucky if you meet the right therapist, the right teacher, uh, the right employer who knows where this technology is and how to signpost you to it. Um, this also means that specialists are often oversubscribed. So by the time we even reach a specialist, there are generally waiting lists and it feels like an extra hurdle to, to, to get over. The other thing I just want to make sure we really understand as we get through this session is assistive technology is not accessibility. Uh, it's something I learned, honestly, when I joined Microsoft six years ago, I was so focused on the individual assessment for the specific piece of equipment to enable access that I was missing the structural inaccessibility that's there for people. And I just humbly say to you, the assistive technology world just doesn't talk about it enough. Uh, we don't recognize that payslip job applications, the, the booking your leave inside a business, these are some of the existing burdens that exist. And we're not talking about those things because sometimes even if you can get into work, it's just really difficult when you're there uh, if there's not technology provided and we're not focusing on the structural deliverable of accessible experiences. This takes skill, expertise, knowledge, budget, buy-in. Uh, and so we've got to really tackle this within the tech sector at large. Now. We've all made progress on the physical building accessibility, and that's been led by things like building codes uh, around the world. Kind of feels odd, doesn't it, when you get to a building that doesn't have a ramp? Yeah, we've got to a sort of critical mass of awareness and knowledge that when you get to one of these buildings, you're like, well, you know, where, where's this? You know, how, how on earth is this missing? Likewise, lifts should have tactile buttons. We have braille displays in our kitchenettes at Microsoft. Handrail continuity is part of the code. There should be no gaps in handrails. 
common use areas or hybrid spaces are commonplace, and obviously accessible meeting spaces are all things that businesses, employers, agencies around the world are starting to get their head around. You wouldn't dare build a building that wasn't accessible now. I mean, it, just, it would just genuinely, it would feel weird. Now, do we feel the same way when we see a video that is not captioned? Probably not. Some of us who are really passionate about it are, but we're not there in the mainstream where it feels like, well, why on earth would anyone create a video that doesn't have captions on it? The truth is, how many of you confidently know how to do it? Okay, so even us in the community should reflect on ourselves for a few seconds and say, this is a skill. We know it's possible, but do we actively deliver on a, on a regular basis? We've got to move to a world where the technology side of things is, is built accessibly and it feels standard. We've got some work to do. Now, the other thing maybe to think about is that some of this has always been made easier just through the advent of technology. Uh, I, I'm old, I, I should have done my visual description. I'm a, a Caucasian male in my mid-40s with no hair and a graying beard. I'm old, okay? Uh, and I was there in the 80s, 90s, looking at assistive technology, focused on desktops mainly, moving to laptops, but think about what laptops did for people in wheelchairs. Immediately, you know, you could put your laptop on your wheelchair tray, the world became a little bit more accessible. We then moved to phones, and so accessibility became a pocket deliverable. Uh, I cycled from London to Paris on a bike once, uh, using uh, Windows CE devices uh, with a group of Microsoft employees and some people who were nonverbal communicating through palm top devices on bikes. Yeah, you know, the new technology created something else that made it possible for people who were nonverbal to carry around a pocket computer with word prediction on it. My God, word prediction. You know, word prediction was all about making people quicker and efficient on a tiny screen. But word prediction also made it really possible for people with physical disabilities uh, and dyslexia and learning disabilities to be more productive uh, on devices. We then moved, my screen's flashing at me, <laughs> we then moved to tablets. Uh, I remember being there when tablets were starting to be mounted more routinely to the front of wheelchairs for people. Uh, and then we're also now starting to move into voice. People have already talked today about the amazing you know, Alexa you know, being able to be controlled in the home and how information is just there through voice. Um, we got rid of the Alexa in my house, just so you know. Uh, not because it's a Microsoft you know, mandate. Uh, I am allowed to buy an Alexa. Um, but because every time my wife said Alexa or shouted at me, Hector, do the dishes, it thought it was Alexa. Uh, and, and Alexa would say, I don't understand what, you're, what you mean. And my wife was, you know, that lasted a day. Uh, so, so, but the point is, voice has become a very normal part of the computer experience that now makes things a little bit more accessible. So, the story I'm trying to tell you here is that tech, almost through accident, is becoming more inclusive. But also, tech is reaching a wider audience. Yeah? It's now easier for people to adopt technology because of the advent of what I call multimodal tech multi-input options. You don't have to use the keyboard. I, I mean, I used keyboards before mouse, yeah? I know, uh, does anybody else in the room know Control Escape on a Windows device? Thank you. You don't look nearly as old as me. Uh, but but that's, what, that's what used to be called the Windows key. Yeah? Then the mouse came out and people started using the start button a bit more. But essentially, we used to learn our keystrokes. You know, that was like the normal experience because we didn't have mouse, yeah? So the point is, technology has changed all the time, but have we kept up? Or have we kept up in the disability space? And I think that's one challenge for all of us in the room to, to think about is how much do you really know? We now live in a world of AI. I refuse to work in a room that does not have captions in the room, okay? It is so easy nowadays. There's literally no excuse. It's in Teams. Uh, you can go through web browsers. There are standalone apps that make it easier for people to have live AI-generated captions, and they're good. You know, they're good, they're really becoming good, and they're really becoming usable. And that creates a brand new sense of flexibility for people uh, in their workspace. You don't have to book a captioner all the time, particularly in different markets around the world where that would even be impossible or not funded. You can now have live captions available routinely in meetings. Um, your, every time you put an image into Word, it puts a label in it for somebody who's blind behind it. The AI does that for us. Humans are terrible at this stuff. They're lazy and ignorant. Yeah? But the technology will actually just have a go and put an image description in and flag it to the user so they, they maybe change it. You can now speak to your computers. Uh, all of this is the advent of AI. 
And because technology is really moving quickly now, and the pandemic has absolutely accelerated this, things are happening in our product that we're kind of being skipped a little bit and moved forward now uh, because there's a real demand for even greater inclusion on our product pushed through by the, by the pandemic. It's AI that's driving it. The devs, the technologists within Microsoft who want to build these new set of tools that empower people are turning to cloud services to essentially build these things. So, um, before we get into the work with DWP as well, I just want to also talk to you a little about, a bit about Microsoft's organizational structure around accessibility. I think when we started on our journey, particularly in the assistive tech space, is we always felt we were talking to the IT teams. But the business decision makers across a business are completely different now, and we've got to think di differently about how we structure accessibility in all of our organizations. So we have a chief accessibility officer at Microsoft, Jenny, you'll, you'll meet her later. Um, but she essentially holds a mandate across every other part of the business. They all report to us on what they're doing on disability inclusion and accessibility. From our business management, our standards management, technical consulting, our comms, our customer support, we're working through support, procurement, sales engineering to build a level of confidence and deliverables against the disability agenda. No matter what job you have sat here in this room today, you can do something extra to be more inclusive. Whether you're putting an event on or buying a piece of technology or building a piece of technology, you have a role to play. And I think this is something we've been on a journey to within Microsoft where we now have mandated training for every Microsoft employee because we just recognize everybody needs to have level 101. 101. How does a blind person read an email? Don't assume people know. You know, people don't know this stuff. And so they've got to be brought closer to it and get confident, build their confidence. So let's take a look at the kind of a typical structure of a business. And let's start mapping accessibility and disability inclusion against it. And I would ask you all to kind of think about, have you all done this? Have you all kind of thought about your own organizations and thought about those, that hub and spoke model, those, those deliverables against disability inclusion? Let's start with HR, CHRO. They're responsible for diversity and inclusion. Is disability in the, disabil in the diversity and inclusion strategy? Let's look at learning and skilling of employees. Companies across the world invest massively in learning of their employees because they want to retain people and skill people and progress people. But is that learning accessible? Do people with disabilities have the same learning opportunities as everybody else in the organization? Look at our employee resource groups. Do we have disability employee resource groups across businesses and organizations? These are all the responsibilities and deliverables of a CHRO. Look at the CIO. Of course, there's the desktop experience and the computing experience of your employees, but let's also look at the biz apps and the, the infrastructure within an organization. Is it accessible? The question you have to ask is, can a blind person read their payslip? Can somebody with dyslexia read their payslip? Like, ask the question, that's a deliverable. Our marketing, are we having a brand experience that includes people with disabilities? Are our comms accessible? Easy one. Are your social media, is your social media within your organization accessible? And if it isn't, super simple to do. Yeah, Twitter, Twitter are here today or, or here, with, you know, they'll tell you how to do it. It's all built in, but it's deliberate inclusion. It has to be done. You, people actually have to realize it's, a, it's something they have to do. That's the responsibility of a CMO. CTO, actually developing the digital skills and the engineering capability within your business. If you don't know how to test and deliver against accessibility, you're gonna be putting terribly inaccessible experiences out there into society, whether it's your website or your product. And frankly, every company has a digital product now. Yeah? Every government organization has a digital product now. We're building apps, we're building digital experiences. It's the CTO's responsibility to make sure that his team or her team can actually deliver accessible. Let's look at the CFO and think about procurement. Is accessibility in your procurement standards? Are you deliberately buying accessible experiences? Are you asking the question of your suppliers? Let's look at legal. Do you have good compliance within your organization? Are you hitting your corporate and social responsibility goals within your organization? And then let's turn to our chief commercial officer. And this is where we're gonna to turn to for the rest of the presentation. If you're gonna be engaging with people with disabilities in society, why are you waiting? Get on the front foot. Every company should be going out and saying, we want 
customers with disabilities. We want to serve people with disabilities in our community. We want to be amazing corporate citizens. We want to be inclusive government organizations. We want to essentially reach everybody that we're trying to reach as an organization. And typically that sits with the people who are out there selling the product, the front end. And we very rarely talk about this in accessibility. We've got to build our confidence there. And we've, we've been on our own journey ourselves. So, let me introduce you to the Department of Work and Pensions. Uh, now, I, I have a long history with the Department of Work and Pensions. I have many, many contacts across the DWP. But essentially, the DWP is the government agency responsible for uh, welfare, benefits, employment of people in UK society. Uh, 20 million claimants and customers. Okay, let's hang on to that word for the rest of this session. Customers. I love that they put that word out there. You are a customer of the UK government if you're going through DWP. 96,000 employees they have, uh, and they are responsible or re reportable to Parliament. There is a DWP Select Committee in the UK Parliament that essentially looks at the strategy. Uh, politics feeds into the work of the DWP. They are a critical part of UK society. It's also where the Disability Minister is housed within UK government. Uh, essentially, this person is making sure that we are delivering on disability inclusion and, and building uh, strategies and, and, and tools to support citizens with disabilities in the UK. Uh, just to, sorry, just quickly put my hand on my heart and tell you, I'm seriously proud of the UK and the, what it does on disability inclusion. Nothing's perfect in the world, but we are deliberate and there is time and attention given to it. Uh, if you think about the role I, I'm currently doing with the government on the tech sector, they have empowered me to go and reach out to the tech sector about disability inclusion. But they have equally done the same for retail, banking, rail. There is a leader within each of those industries trying to drive change with the mandate of the UK government behind them. And I think that's a really, a really excellent leadership uh, message. Let's quickly turn to assistive technology though, and how do people find their AT? How do people get to it? What is the citizen journey? Who are the people that, peop that people with disabilities interface with in society through health, social services, education, and work? Well, in health, it might be through a medical engagement, it might be through therapists, your speech therapist, your occupational therapist, your physios. In social services, you might be engaging through housing, social workers, therapy within, occupational therapy within social care, uh, care, transport facilities. In education, uh, we have obviously the access to education, uh, the, the, the assessors for assistive technology within education, but then also the content experience. Is content accessible within education? And within work, we would have job search, adjustments and access to work. Uh, these are all programs essentially to kind of drive more people with disabilities or support people with disabilities. The question I would ask you all is, how many of the people who work in those fields, the armies of professionals out there, understand the modern digital experience of people with disabilities? And that's what we've tried to tackle through this project with DWP. Um, I have to say, we've been knocking on an open door, and I'll just quickly tell you a bit of the backstory to it. So in January 2018, I sat in front of a, a select committee in the House of Parliament. Uh, there's a picture of me here with uh, Robin from AbilityNet and somebody from the RNIB whose name I've forgotten, I'm sorry. Uh, but essentially, we sat in front of the DWP select committee and we talked about the experiences of people with disabilities. And we quite quickly went into innovation and the role of the tech sector. And it was like, you've been able to type one-handed in Windows since Windows 95. <laughs> and all you've got to do is hit your right shift key five times and people don't know it. So the, the comment I'm very quick, clearly made and what we're really trying to get across to the politicians involved was the challenge is not technology. The challenge is awareness. The challenge is absolutely awareness. People don't know what's possible. I didn't do so badly because they invited me back in November 2020 and I started again. Uh, a lot of this is down to education and frankly awareness. I guarantee there are people listening today who do not know how a blind person reads an email and groups of politicians started nodding their head in firm agreement. Absolutely, I've got no idea. And if you don't know, how can you solve? How can you support people if you don't know what the experience is? So we partnered more and we got in touch with the DWP leadership uh, and we were given permission to make a very public statement that we would train 26,000 work coaches within DWP as part of our renewed commitment to accessibility in May last year. Uh, it's quite a bold statement. You know, you've got to do it. <laughs> you put it out there on a blog, you know, and this was a Brad Smith blog, the president of Microsoft, who it was in his blog, and it was like, yeah, we're going we're to train them. 
But it wasn't that we wanted to just have UK impact. From the very start of this, what we're trying to do is set a model for others to follow. And this is why I'm so delighted to be here with you today, to kind of, you know, hopefully find others who want to do something similar uh, and get that knowledge out there. Uh, Jenny Le Flurry, our Chief Accessibility Officer, recently also gave a very similar evidence to the UK, so UK, the US Senate. Uh, and it came through loud and clear. You know, there wasn't awareness, but when politicians were enlightened to what was possible, it was kind of clear. Let's make it easier. Let's make sure that knowledge reaches people. And so there's a role for corporates to meet with uh, governments and make sure that we actually sort of share our ambitions in this space. So I'm going to take a sip of water there, uh, and I'm going to meet you two Honestly, one of my new best friends, uh, there's a sort of semi-love affair going on between me and Lee in a, in a very kind of, you know, you know, <laughs> well, there's a word, isn't there? But essentially, you know, we've got to know each other. We didn't know each other a year ago, uh, but we, you know, I'm her biggest fan and she's kind of weirdly one of my biggest fans and we kind of just have this general love in whenever we meet and I hope that comes across to you. Uh, let me just ask Lee to just quickly introduce herself. Hello, Hector. Hello, everybody. My name is Lee Miller. I'm a senior leader in the Department of Work and Pensions. My job is all about helping customers to secure work, stay in work and progress in work. It's a great role to have and it means I have lots of different things I'm involved in, including disability confidence, how we accredit and professionalise our work coaches so they can offer the best customer service possible. And also now the Microsoft project all about accessibility fundamentals. So uh, the way this is going to work is Lee's going to give you her wisdom. I'm going to interject, contextualize, and we're going to get through the, this project. Uh, just quickly, something she said there, customer service, excellent customer service. I mean, this is a kind of a, a given, isn't it? All of us as organizations want to have amazing customer service. And as work coaches who are tasked with you know, getting people into work, they want to create the best service possible. The leaders who run these teams want to create the best experience. And the best experience is all about the end product. What does the citizen see when they engage with DWP? And how can we start to make that better? And how can we be ambitious about it? OK, more from Lee. So I first became involved in accessibility fundamentals mm, about a year ago now. There'd been a big public announcement um, where DWP and Microsoft had jointly declared their partnership in training 26,000 work coaches to understand accessibility more. And I wasn't really involved at that point. I was aware of the announcement. I could see it was going on, but it was, if you like, somebody else's job. And then about three weeks later, my boss rang me out of the blue and said, Lee, I've got a job for you here. I'd like you to make sure that partnership commitment actually happens. And actually, I can remember thinking, what's it got to do with me? You know, somebody else has sorted all that out and agreed to do all of that. How come I'm actually going to be doing the implementation of it? Of course, I realise now. I realised when I thought about it really that actually accessibility isn't a specialism, is it? It's, it's, it's about me, it's about you, it's about how we help our customers, about how we help our colleagues. It should be about something we think about all the time. And in fact, I should know better anyway because I'm, I'm an accessibility user myself. You know, I have Parkinson's disease. I was, I was diagnosed with that about 15 years ago and I rely every day on special kits and adjusted job design to ensure I can stay at work. And I've been so, so lucky to work for an employer that can make all those things happen for me, can ensure that I can stay at work, I can feel valued, and I can keep doing the job that I love. And did I also know that most people with a disability, like myself, acquire that through age? I wasn't born with Parkinson's disease, I just acquired that as I kind of aged. And I'm sure that's the same for so many people who must be getting a diagnosis of some sort, thinking, how on earth can I stay at work? And the work I've been doing with Microsoft has made me realise, actually, just how critical it is to not just think about accessibility as a, something that you have to pay money for or that you have to spend lots of time on. Sometimes it's just about knowing the simple things that can make a difference. And I can remember having that kind of 
kind of kapow moment when I started working with Microsoft and Hector and his team, I sat my, my team down, there's about four or five of us, um, talking us through the actual project they already had. And he was showing me some things on the screen that I could use to magnify. Um, we had some dictation functionality. And I was, I didn't know that that was there. You know, how long has that been on my kit? Is it normally available? And of course it had been, I just wasn't aware of it. And for me, it just made me think about how important it was to make sure that some of the very simple things were just made more visible to people. So there's a super important moment there. It's like, it's just that penny drop moment. It's like, why did I not know that? And I think that's, that should almost be the takeaway from any session like this. Uh, when Lee saw that dictation could be on her home device as well as her work device, as somebody with Parkinson's, she just immediately went, I'll be using that the minute I go home. And so this tangible takeaway is what landed very, very quickly for Lee. Now, we put a lot of time and effort into training, and we want to be as transparent as possible on the training that we deliver internally uh, at Microsoft. I'm just going to run through a quick bit of video uh, showing some of our internal learning tools. Uh, and hopefully, I'll just scroll up. But essentially, we offer very specific and rich training for people all across the business at Microsoft, from kind of HR practices all the way through to, as I say, tech development. And we're putting it out there uh, on our learning platforms for teachers and MS Learn for the technology community. Uh, but many of us don't find it. Yeah? Uh, there's a, tra a training course out there called Accessibility Fundamentals, and it goes through disability etiquette, tools that are available for people with disabilities, how to build digital experiences. Simple and you learn some really nice takeaways. It's all out there, and we're very happy to share those links with anybody after the, after the talk today. Um, but it wasn't right for Lee, and I just want to quickly let Lee share why. People. What we did first of all, though, was to look at the product that Microsoft had got. And there were some things, actually, that leapt out at us in terms of sequencing about the kind of content wanted to actually mix the content up and have different formats. But we didn't want to make those decisions without going and talking to our users. So the first thing I did was set up a user group. People who were work coaches, and these were work coaches across all of our job centres. Uh, there were also work coaches that worked out in schools, who may be prison advisors, um, people who helped uh, community um, support as well. And we got those together with um, a few of our accessibility users as well, who are colleagues in our Thrive network. And they looked at the product with us. They gave us some great feedback. They gave us some great ideas. And collectively, we worked with Microsoft to actually reshape it. So it was, if you like, our own. And it was in the way that we actually wanted it to be. So within Microsoft's internal training, we have key messages from our leaders. Why does accessibility and disability inclusion to, uh, matter to Microsoft? Yeah. When we, saw, we shared this with DWP, it was like, we can do the same. And so they got their perm sec at the time to record a message to the community. We value you as work coaches and we want you to have this knowledge so that you can go and give our customers a great, amazing experience. But there's also one other slightly important person, I'm, I'm joking, uh, who we wanted to put a message from. So I'm going to play you part of the DWP training now. Hi there, folks. I'm Jenny Leigh Flurry. I'm the Chief Accessibility Officer at Microsoft. And firstly, I want to thank you for taking this course, for investing your time in disability and accessibility. But that's not really why I'm here. I'm here to tell you why it matters. I've had the privilege of being in Seattle now for 15 years. But originally, I'm from the UK. In fact, I started at Microsoft in 2005. But I thought, what better to bring you, well, one of the reasons that I love living here. It's gorgeous. And I feel so privileged. And I owe that debt to a lot of what DWP does. In my 20s, I worked for a company in Leeds, I was new into IT. In fact, my background is music. I qualified as a, with a B-Muzz for those who know all of those qualifications. And I had great goals to be a classical musician. But I also had to pay rent. And so I got a job working on an IT help desk. I love that job. 
It taught me so much. And I found that I loved IT. But I was on a help desk with declining hearing. In fact, I'm now severely profoundly deaf. And in my mid-twenties, I was pretty struggling. So as I went to small companies, big companies, in that boom and bust era, yes, I'm a bit old, I found that I needed to self-identify. I actually needed to ask for help for probably one of the first most significant times in my life. I had to learn a new set of tools to help me navigate how to be deaf in the workplace where I'm deceptive. No one knows that I can't hear you, but I cannot hear voice. I cannot hear speech. I cannot hear ruckus. I cannot hear what's going on around me right now. I found the Access to Work program. And the Access to Work program helped me to get my first set of digital hearing aids. But the most important thing they taught me was how to be my own best self-advocate. They showed me what was available to me, all the different things that I could use in my day-to-day -day life, tools that I use today, captioning, transcription, making sure that when I sit in a room as a deaf person, I sit, when we're in rooms, I sit, well, I don't sit with the window behind the person I'm looking at. I make sure that I can see everyone. They showed me, well, the importance of learning sign language as my hearing continued to decline. And most importantly, they empowered me. So instead of me cutting off opportunities because of my deafness, I took them. Those tools, that confidence, that knowledge that I learned in that period, I carry with me today. And now I get the privilege of living in an amazing place, leading a team working on disability and accessibility in a company that's, well, 180,000 people work at Microsoft. And then we get to partner with amazing organizations and agencies like yours. So take this with the knowledge that it matters. It's so important. Invest your time in learning, yes, about the technology, learning about what's available, because it's changing so fast right now. Knowing that that knowledge you will give to someone else, and you could be the difference in whether they take that next job or not, or whether they're successful in that job or not. You will empower them we're seeing disability as a part of being human and a part of, well, life. And knowledge that there is no ceiling, no limit to what any human can achieve if they are empowered with the skills, knowledge, and technology to be successful. So, from Seattle to the UK, and I look Belfast. forward to seeing you all soon. Maybe from that side of the pond, because let's be real, I miss a decent cup of tea and some decent newspapers. <laughs> but thank you, for now, for investing your time in helping me and helping you to help others. Thanks, for I mean, a great reaction, isn't it? But fundamentally, what do we want? We want work coaches to feel valuable. We want work coaches to feel like they deliver an amazing service to society, uh, but we want them to learn that there was a, a graduate of the Access to Work scheme who had just like taken it and run, and that that's, you know, that's something we can all do to pay this knowledge forward. Stop. Platform warning. Okay. One of the things we learned straight away in the engagement here is that making sure that you're doing training on accessibility, you can't deliver accessibility training on a non-accessible platform. It's brilliant. <laughs> uh, so as you think about whether you want to do this or not, do think about you know, having that in your mindset before you start. You don't want to start annoying people at the very start of putting this out there, but there's no way you can deliver accessibility on a non-accessible platform. Happy to help anyone who comes across this. Um, when you meet some of the people who are responsible for learning, you're going to have to engage a growth mindset and say, we want to do this. But I'll tell you what, having the leaders recorded messages make it much easier to get that accessibility stuff through. Okay? and then hopefully leads to more accessible learning. 
The steering committee that DWP set up was across disciplines. We made sure we reached out widely. And actually, the Microsoft account team was super useful here because they knew so many people across the business, from IT to digital, etc. Uh, bringing colleagues with disabilities in, nothing for us without us. People with disabilities at DWP, making sure it's what they wanted to deliver as well uh, and that they were included. And then, of course, bringing those others driving accessibility, things like the learning platform, in to make sure that we could be successful. Back to Lee. So where are we now? Well, we've done really well. We have nearly 15,000 work coaches trained on accessibility fundamentals at the end of April. And we know there'll be many, many more when we have a look at the data next week for the end of May. I think it's an incredible achievement. I'm really, really proud of what's happened. But I'm also really, really proud of some of the feedback that we've been getting from our work coaches. They've been telling us actually that it's one of the best learning products they've ever used. We've had people write to us and say thank you. We've had people talk about how they've actually used the learning to think about how differently they can advise their customers in job search advice. We've had people say that they've been able to help family members as well. They've been taking the learning home with them and making a difference there. It's been pretty overwhelming actually. But to think that there's so many of our work coaches now know about accessibility in a completely different way. And it may not change the way that they do their job today, but it may well be that it changes their job tomorrow with a customer that they can help in a different way. And that's what's so important. So Lee excitedly texted me this morning to share that the uh, May numbers are in, uh, and they're now at 17,000 of 26,000 work coaches in five months. That is pretty amazing. <laughs> and this is not the normal result for training. <laughs> training's hard. <laughs> Getting people to take work training is really hard, but the leadership messages, the culture play, the excitement that this team built up is, is, is something to really behold. Uh, some of that comes across in Lee's final comments. So a year ago, I was sitting there thinking, blimey, 26,000 is a big number. Now I'm thinking, it's really not enough. From our experience so far, we know that people have taken the learning on board, they've completed it, they've loved it, they've given us fantastic feedback, and they're telling us it makes a difference. So why keep it a secret, really? Why just keep it to our work coaches that work in the Job Centre Plus network? So we're going to be a little bit bolder and we're going to look into the whole of the DWP job role families and different areas of work and encourage them to take on the learning as well. We've already completed a presentation to some of our executive team members and we've had some great feedback and already some positive steps being taken to socialise it further. So that's really great news. And it means that we'll go further than the work coaches. We'll be supporting colleagues who talk to our customers on the phone, maybe about retirement benefits, maybe about other benefits that they could be entitled to. It'll all be about how we can actually improve the customer experience and connect with our customers in a better way. Ultimately, though, we'd like to be even more ambitious and we'd like to see what a difference we can make across government. There are many, many other government departments that work with our customers and we think we can make a difference there too. It's one step at a time, though, so let's work to see whether we can actually spread our wings much further in the WP, be more ambitious there, and let's take it further from then on in. I'm sure we will do. I hope you will do. So, so <laughs> Lee's been on quite a journey uh, from why me? <laughs> like, why are they giving me this work to do, this public statement, to I want to take over the world? And, I, and, I, and I've got to say, it's been fabulous to watch. Um, DWP is the, is the citizen department that 
make sure that people with disabilities are included. It has things to say to the Department for Education. It has things to say to HMRC. It has things to say to our Home Office. It has things to say to every government department about the routine inclusion of people with disabilities. Uh, and we want to, you know, we want to use our connections at Microsoft to really open those doors. I spend far too much of my time speaking to CIOs who don't understand what disability is and want to, but need some help. Uh, and I think we've got to lean in and find partnerships between governments, between corporates, between the disabled people's organizations and not-for-profits to make sure that people build their confidence. Uh, that this disability confidence scheme in the UK is fantastic. Uh, over 20,000 businesses signed up to the government agenda on disability, but not saying we're perfect, saying we want to be increasingly confident, and the government trying to hold companies to account on their journey. Um, maybe we can do a session on disability confidence another year, but I would definitely take a look at what the UK government's trying to do. I think it is a model for others to follow. Um, I'm a little bit more ambitious than Lee even still. Uh, we're gonna take over the world, right? So let's reach into every labor department. Let's reach into where people with disabilities interface with society and make sure that the people who serve them understand that this technology can empower people with disabilities across the world. I want the next time somebody breaks their arm for them to leave ER, I had to practice that a few times, A&E, uh, is what we call it over here, uh, but to leave ER pressing the right shift key on their keyboard five times because the nurse decided to tell them that that's how they could type one-handed and that they could dictate on a Windows device when they go back to work the next day. It's not happening today. But it's this work that will start to drive some of that influence out there. That's really our, our hope. So next steps. Take the learning further across DWP. Find other leaders who want to lean in here and be the champion for accessibility in what they do. And recognize the impact that every organization has, in inverted commas, a product. We all have a product. And we've got to work deliberately and confidently to make that accessible. But the only way we do that is by amplifying the workforces that already sell that product and drive that product to recognize that they can have an impact on the lives of people with disabilities. And let's, you know, let's get ambitious there. We all have an impact out there when it comes to particularly the digital footprint that we create. Go big or go home is one of the kind of bits of advice that I learned very early at Microsoft. Uh, our chief marketing officer kind of really drummed it into me. Don't be shy. Go big, go home. Make bold statements and then deliver afterwards. Let's go. Adapt and align with the aims of the organization. Don't try and crowbar what you think is going to work inside an organization. The fact that they, we, we changed the training is probably one of the most important parts of this story. Um, and actively measure success. Lee knows 17,000 work coaches have been trained. It's not hit and hope. It's not launch and leave. It's measure the progress and hold, hold the organization and the executive sponsors to account to what you've said you're going to do. And with that, I hit 1.15 precisely. Thank you so much. <laughs> have we got any time for questions? Oh. Any questions from the floor? We have a roaming mic, which people will have to wait for, but I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, Andy, here, wait for the mic. So Hector, it's Andy Imperato with Disability Rights California. I'm curious what you think about kind of simplicity of design and intuitive design as a form of accessibility and whether we can expect over time Microsoft Teams to be more intuitive, more like Zoom, because right now I don't experience it that way. <laughs> uh, difficult for me to say no to that, Andy, I'd say. Uh, yeah, you know, let me, let, me, let me be totally frank with you. We've, got, we've always got to compare like with like, and every, every, every product's on a journey, yeah? Uh, there were some things that were amazing in Teams at the outset, and there were some things that were dropped, and that's absolutely clear. Um, but everything's, you know, we know because we got amazing feedback from the community very quickly, and we, you know, we got into it. And the other thing is, because we've been so invested in the community for the last few years, you know, it, we were allowed to make progress and, and kind of do it. But remember, Teams is an operating system. It's not, it's just not, it's not just a meeting space. It's everything integrated, the app experience, and everything like that. So it's a complex thing. Uh, I don't, don't want to get into too much <laughs> detail on this in the, on this forum. Um, but I would say, you know, feedback is critical to the kind of what we're doing. We're starting to see a lot more um, 
discoverability of accessibility within products. I think that's the, the really great trend that we're starting to see. Um, if you look at Windows 11 now, it's called accessibility and it's right next to your Wi-Fi settings. So we may not have to do training settings in the training sessions like this in the future because we know that discoverability has been worked on. Um, projects like this really help us also explain to engineers at Microsoft that things are not discoverable enough, right? When, when, when people are saying, wow, I didn't know you could do this, and they work with people with disabilities every day, we've got a discoverability issue. Thanks for the tricky question straight off the bat, Andy. I mean, like, you know, hit, hit, you know give me a cuddle first. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you for an interesting uh, presentation. This is Elaine Katz with Kessler Foundation in New Jersey. So if I'm looking to, say, replicate this project in a state, I have two questions on it. Who, who's paying for this? And then is the training and the programs available kind of open source for other places to adapt? Yeah, absolutely. So we put our training out on uh, MS Learn, uh, Accessibility Fundamentals, and that's your kind of your core deliverable. We also put a lot of training out on those other links, Accessibility at a Glance, but what we would encourage any organization to do is build what they want to build on accessibility. Now, you know, that might be other tools and processes, you know, important to, important to you. Um, the, the kind of the key components of that should sit within your own learning platform. You can use ours. Yeah? And there are ways for us to work with you to develop a kind of you know, a tracking mechanism to see how many people with a particular email address are taking a particular training on a Microsoft platform. But it's not going to drive the same impact that you want to drive. So to me, it's getting together with your team at Microsoft, getting together with the accessibility team at Microsoft, uh, getting together with, the, with your team to work out what is it you actually want to deliver here. Yeah? What, you know, what, is your, what is your learning sequence look like? Uh, that was the thing that really came through loud and clear from Lee, was that we've got to make this DWP training, not Microsoft training. Uh, but the takeaways are the features, you know, the, the tangible buttons that you can press in front of a, of a job seeker to make sure uh, that, that it works for them. One of the early anecdotes, that, or one of the scenarios that we, that we, that we brought up was, um, if somebody who's illiterate, functionally illiterate, goes into a job center and says, I can't read this job description, what do you do? And the question should be, will you just right click on it and ask your browser to read it for you? And the existing answer was, well, let's take you to the disability specialist and find you some support. And all the person with a disability wants at that point is like, tell me which buttons to press. Yeah? So, so there's, a, there's a piece here about uh, building the confidence and, and kind of putting the deliverable accessibility more at the front end of an organization. But, but really, the answer to your question is, you know, partner with us, work with us, connect with us, and we'll, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll hopefully see if we can give you some collateral. All of our collateral is free, open source. We'll, we'll share it willingly with you. I want to congratulate the UK. This program is fantastic. I am hard of hearing. I'm challenged to see every word correctly up here. So I would like whomever is in charge of this to please contact me because I would like a template of what you are doing in the UK. We needed that in the United States. We need that every country in the world. This is amazing. It's beautiful. And thank you, Microsoft. I want to let everybody know that there is a disability answer desk <laughs> at Microsoft. I have used it prolifically, and I have given them feedback to their Microsoft Teams products, and they have implemented that feedback. So go ahead and you do that for the questions you have. <laughs> thank, you, thank you so much. Um, we want to do this with you. I mean, that's 100% what we want to do. But let, let me just let you into kind of a secret. The people who look after local government or national government, you know, it's a full-time job for us to make sure that they understand that they can do something in this space on accessibility. So what we need to do is kind of create our own working parties with countries across the world to help them kind of bring the right stakeholders to the table and get this out there. Don't wait for it to be perfect. You know, one thing, you know, there's nothing better than us sort of saying we're going to do it, yeah, and then we built towards perfection. But honestly, I think to get 17,000 people in five months in any organization would be, you know, would be success. So I'm, I hope we're on that right path with you, and we'd love to emulate it with others. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks.
Hector, that was fascinating. We're going to take another break for transitions into other rooms or back here. Um, and our next session uh, starts in about eight minutes or so, and that will be um, around the Northern Ireland Civil Service. Looking forward to that one. See you then.